All right, and we are back again tonight. So yesterday we had a record, another record, two weeks in a row, jobless claims. And that's not the real number. Things are going to get worse. There is a backlog at the state level here in the United States. I don't think it's going to, it's going to take at least a couple weeks, maybe a month before we really know the numbers of how many people are filing for unemployment and the jobless claims before we get a real sense of things. Um, based on my conversations with some small business owners who are reaching out to me through emails and uh, social media messages, also messages on Patreon, I got a couple about payrolls, uh, the amount of biz small businesses that have been cutting payroll, it's pretty crazy. One podcast listener, a longtime podcast listener, works for a, uh, I think, payroll company, payroll software company, and was telling me that uh, a number of the businesses were cutting payroll by more than 90% lately. So just really sad. The numbers don't reflect this yet. So the jobs data, the non-farms payroll and unemployment rate that came out on Friday, April 3rd, shows that 701,000 jobs were lost and the unemployment rate soared the most in 45 years. So just like the 113 straight months of employment growth is over now, today's payrolls report, you can see the, the article on your screen. While today's payroll report was expected to be not quite as terrible as the recent initial claims suggested, especially since the March survey week took place around March 13th or ahead of the big shutdown and layoff announcements, it ended up being catastrophic nonetheless with the Bureau of Labor Statistics reporting moments ago, well, it said this was earlier in the morning, that a whopping 701,000 jobs were lost in March, seven times more than the 100,000 expected. Who the hell has that low estimates? These Wall Street guys are way overpaid. They're freaking way optimistic. Unbelievable how off these guys are. These guys make a lot of money who are crunching these estimates. It's unbelievable how off they are. They have no touch with reality. Send out some emails or phone calls to some college buddies or ask the kids of their friends who they graduated college with if they're a little older. Find out how their, their employment situation is. And just shy of the worst payrolls print recorded during the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. So we're almost already there. And these numbers are, are just getting started, in my opinion. Um, based on what I'm hearing with restaurants and bars and the amount of people laid off, I mean, we're going we're gonna to get way over 20,000, uh, excuse me, 20% 20, 20 total unemployment, unless they change the formulas. Maybe they change the formulas again. There was an estimate out, let me see here, a couple days ago, March, no, last week, March 27th, from Ethan Wolfman at Yahoo Finance that a 20% of small businesses could fail, but I think the unemployment rate could go a lot higher than 20%. I think we could be looking at 30% unemployment. I don't know if they're going to tell the truth because we're in lies, rules changes environment now. So I don't, the, the real man on the street, so the labor participation rate was bad months ago. It's been bad for a long time. But the, the government statistics that were o always overly optimistic with jobs and unemployment, they stopped counting people who stopped looking for jobs. If you're not familiar with the games that are played, if you're new to this, new to my channel, new to, you know, going down the rabbit hole of financial information here about the truth. Okay, so back to this article. Uh, revisions, uh, not like it matters. There were also revisions from pre from previous months. The change in total non-farm payroll employment for January was revised down by 59,000. Wow. Yeah, only 59,000 people. Remember, the stock market went up a lot. It popped again in January. So the pop on this, I remember this, the pop on the payroll data when the stock market was still going up, they just revised most of the gains down. From 273,000 job gains down to 214,000 because the trading algorithms, the perma bulls on Wall Street, the expensive suits and stuffy shirts who quote government statistics like they're perfectly acceptable, the high frequency trading algorithms that only read the headlines, that don't care about the truth, that don't care that everything's revised downwards one month, two months, three months later by a lot. They traded that information up a lot in stocks in January and February. A lot of retail money was caught off guard. I was trying to warn people about the coronavirus outbreak in Wuhan, and a lot of people didn't listen and was warning people about the oil market potentially crashing, airline stocks, cruise lines, cruise ships. 
Stock market was based on the stuff I was seeing with the global supply chain two months ago. I was worried about the stock market too. And people were telling me uh, that it's fine. Look at Trump's State of the Union. It's fine. Everything's fine. Stock market's going to keep going up. Uh, people were screaming at me in the comment section that the Dow was going to 35,000 and I was a moron. And I didn't deserve any paying customers. Okay, uh, revised down 59,000. Change for February was revised up by 2,000 from 273,275. Weird. With these revisions, employment gains in January and February combined were 57,000 uh, lower than previously reported. Private sector jobs dropped by 713,000. With almost all the drop, the result of a record collapse in service providing jobs. So service providing jobs are bartenders, servers at restaurants, people at hotels, hospitality management, people in shopping malls, strip malls, you know, people working at bricks and mortars, retail, jobs like that. Makes a lot of sense because no mass gatherings of people, people are ordering online. If you if you get food from a restaurant, it's either delivery or you have to order it in the parking lot of the restaurant and they bring it out to you. You don't need a lot of people for that. So we're, we're just getting started here, I think, with the unemployment data and the jobless claims because the amount of people, amount of younger adult Americans that were working service sector jobs was very high. There was a lot of young adult Americans with one or two college degrees, sometimes more, who were working, let's say, low-paying service jobs because they, they couldn't find a high-paying job because normally their major didn't get them a good paying job. They picked out the wrong major. I've heard that story a lot the last 10 years. And those jobs are gone, um, at least temporarily. Although I will talk about Hedgeye's running. Hedgeye just ran a recent video out there that they think a lot of the restaurants are not um, done collapsing. There's going to be a lot of bankruptcies in the casual dining sit-down restaurants that a lot of them are not going to come back. So I, I think unless the federal government steps in, I... I'm going to do something for patrons. I already have one restaurant out there that is already just to get any revenues at all. They're discounting their pizzas 50% and they're discounting other menu items by 75%, I think, just to get any business at all, which obviously is not very smart that they're discounting that heavily. But they have inventory they have to clear. They have a lot of problems. They just drew the revolving credit facility to buy time. But I'm sure a lot of other restaurants, a lot of casual dining sit-down restaurant chains are like that too. So unless they get bailed out, you know, a lot of these companies are probably going to be bankrupt in six months. Maybe not even that. We Remember, we just I covered this last week. I was the first person to talk about it because the story only came out an hour or two after I um, uh, came out before. The story only came out about an hour or two before I covered it about uh, Cheesecake Factory said on April 1st that they could not pay rents. So Cheesecake, and cheese, if you're not familiar with Cheesecake Factory, if you're not an American or haven't visited here, uh, Cheesecake Factory is at a mall. They normally pay very high rent in a shopping mall. So they're like the key, they're the key restaurant in a lot of shopping malls. So they pay very high rent for nice buildings. They offer really, they used to offer really large portions at a, the price point was higher, but you got a large portion. So Cheesecake Factory announced uh, last week that on April 1st, they were not going to be able to pay any of their rents at any of their restaurant locations. I suspect that, that, that they will not be the only one announcing that. I have not seen a lot of other announcements yet from other restaurants, but if I spent more time doing research, I suspect that that would be the case. So I may put out a piece in the next couple days for my patrons about some other restaurants behind the paywall there with some technical analysis charts and then digging into the financial statements showing how much cash is on the balance sheet how much debt when is it due i mean if these these companies don't get bailouts i mean some of them it's curtains if they if they can't pay rent oh is it bad okay service sector jobs leisure hospital okay all these service sector jobs leisure and hospitality so travel tourism casinos hotels they were the hardest hit according to the data Unemployment rate soared from 3.5% to 4.3, led by a recent surge in Hispanic unemployment. In March, the unemployment rate increased by 0.9 percentage points to 4.4%. This is the largest over-the-month increase in the rate in the unemployment rate since January 1975, so 45 years, according to the article headline, when the increase was also 0.9 percentage points. So that was stagflation. 
The number of unemployed persons rose by 1.4 million to 7.1 million in March. Remember, again, the government, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, does not count an un someone as unemployed if they've stopped looking for work for at least six months. The sharp increases John Williams of Shadow Stats does, though. So John Williams of Shadow Stats has more accurate information on that. Sharp increases in these measures reflect the effects of the coronavirus and efforts to contain it. The participation rate plunged from a... The, the, our video is going to get demonetized anyway. Coronavirus, coronavirus fallouts in the title. The participation rate plunged from a seven-year high to tie the lowest level in five years. And uh, average hourly earnings, actually, it increased, shockingly. Average hourly earnings for all employees on private non form payrolls increased by 11 cents. So people are getting paid more, but I think average uh, hours per hourly employee is down. So I think a lot of companies are were cutting back prior to this coronavirus outbreak. We're cutting back on a lot of hourly employees' hours. So they were not full-time employees, did not get benefits. Some st the different states are different. I think um, in certain states it's 40 hours to be a full-time employee, so you get healthcare benefits and other benefits. This article also from Michael Bar Bartiromo. I guess he I guess he's um, Maria Bartiromo's brother. <laughs> she must have gotten a job. She got him a job at Fox News. Good job, Maria. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 11% 11% of US restaurants may close for good amid coronavirus pandemic Trump says it's possible. At a press conference on Thursday this article is from March 27th so last week. At a press conference on Thursday President Trump appeared to agree with a National Restaurant Association survey that determined up to 11% of the country's restaurants could shut down permanently due to loss of revenue amid coronavirus prompted closures. In response to a question from the press, which cited a National Restaurant Association survey that found 3% of all restaurants had already closed for good, President Trump said he had heard 3% could be lost, but acknowledged that 10 or 11% could go under in total. Trump, speaking at a briefing alongside members of the Coronavirus Task Force, started by saying he understands the restaurant business very well. It's a very delicate business. Let me add that it is very capital intensive and the profit margins are not good. It's a business that is not easy, Trump said. I always say in the restaurant business, you can serve 30 great meals to a person or a family, and they love it. One bad meal, number 31, they never come back again. It's a very tough business. The president, however, seemed to, it is a low profit margin, high sales turnover business. If it's run well, if it's not run well, it's bankruptcy. The president and lo losing lots and lots of money, going deep in debt, uh, there's tons of, TV shows about this, like uh, Bar Rescue with John Taffer, Restaurant Impossible with Do uh, Robert Irvine. Great chef. Those are good shows. Since everyone's looking for TV shows, Bar Rescue is good. Restaurant Impossible is good. Watch those shows and then decide if you want to start a restaurant or a bar. It's not easy. President, however, seemed to believe that of the restaurants that have, or the Gordon Ramsay show, forgot about Gordon Ramsay. Of course, Gordon Ramsay. President, however, seemed to believe that of the restaurants that have been or will be lost, they'll all come back in one form or another. I disagree. And we're making it easy for people, he added. Look what we're doing in terms of loans, what we're doing in terms of salaries. They'll all come back. It may not be the same restaurant. It may not be the same ownership, but they'll all be back. So the president's remarks made reference to the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, or CARES Act, which is aimed at providing relief for individuals, critical industries, small businesses affected by the coronavirus outbreak, with nearly $350 billion earmarked for the latter, ca latter category, which includes restaurants. Okay, so now it's time to talk about some of my sources for this podcast. I had a conversation with a friend and a patron my friend Kevin, who is a small business, successful small business owner. I won't say uh, where Kevin lives, but he, he owns a couple uh, gyms, Planet Fitness gyms. And he was having discussions with me yesterday about this bill. Apparently, Congress yesterday made some more adjustments to it last night. And he sent me from a small business advocate some analysis, like a synopsis of what Congress decided to do. Apparently, in this bill... For the SBA loans, Congress decided not only, well, first of all, not only is Congress going to have the Small Business Association is going to be is going to be many, many months overwhelmed, might be over six months overwhelmed on this. This is how overwhelmed a lot of these small business association offices are going to be with the claims. But on top of this, 
President Trump, the Trump administration, and Congress decided to have, you know, BlackRock, uh, Citibank, Bank of America, JP Morgan handle this. And they're not going to do a good job. There's a lot of problems with this. Also, you have the Democrats in Congress that are horse trading. The Democrats have made demands about pumping money back into the Community Reinvestment Act, which, if you're familiar with the 2008 financial crisis, caused a lot of the subprime mortgage-backed secure subprime loans some prime mortgage loans that turned into subprime mortgage backed securities that were chopped up like toxic sausage. Anyways, uh, my conversations with Kevin, he sent me this really good summary of the bill and in the bill. And this is, this is so bad because if you've ever run a business, you know that the you you have a lot of different expenses. If you're a small business owner, I have a lot of small business owners that listen to this podcast. So you know that your expenses are not just labor. Okay. You have, you have to pay your rent, you have to pay maybe leases for a property plan and equipment. You have to maintain your property plan and equipment. So when things are good to go again, when we do restart the economy after the coronavirus, hopefully in the near future, when things are fixed, you'll be ready to start generating cash flow again. Well, guess what the bill, guess what Congress put in the bill. And honestly, after seeing the summary of what Congress put in the bill, the only people who could have decided to put the stuff in the bill are hardcore Marxist or hardcore socialists who inherently devoutly believe in Mar uh, Karl Marx's labor theory of value, which has been disproven countless times in the last 150 plus years. And the Karl Marx's labor theory of value is that the goods, the value of the goods is commensurate with the labor that goes into them. So not that if there's no demand for goods, but that the labor is the most important part, the most important value the workers' labor of what goes into the goods. And that's how this legislation was written. And let me explain why. So the legislation says that 75% of all the SBA loans that these small business owners are getting, 75% have to go to payroll, have to go to paying workers. If you run a small business and you're paying your workers 75% of everything, what other money, unless you already have a lot of money saved up, or you have access to credit lines, and that would be dangerous. I wouldn't pull credit lines in this environment. You don't have any other money left from those SBA loans. They're assuming then that you're going to be able to pay with the other 25% that you're getting in your SBA loans, which are going to probably, some of them may be waived and forgiven. But they're assuming that with the remaining 25%, you're going to be able to pay your rent on buildings. You're going to be able to pay for maintaining property, plan, and equipment, for leases for equipment. I was listening to uh, the business channel, and they were just talking about how, how a spa owner was leasing all of her equipment. And the SBA loan said that she had to pay her employees, but then she didn't have any money to pay, money to pay to, for the leases on her equipment. How are you supposed to run a business? Congress is saying that the money has to go to labor. It has to go to the workers. But then they're saying if you if you don't spend at least 75% of the money borrowed, you're risking fraud charges. It's ridiculous. The only people that could have written that are people that have no business experience. You know, these champagne socialists, these stuck-up scumbag hypocrite Marxists like AOC drinking expensive margarita ingredients on a live stream show, staying in her $2,500 a month luxury condo or apartment or whatever here in DC, and not even going back to New York City to visit her constituents in a poor district to make sure they're okay. Those are the types of scumbags that do this type of legislation. 75% required to go to payroll. Unbelievable. Welcome to Dystopia. So this small business association loans are not going to be as good as you think. First of all, the banks are siphoning off billions in fees for themselves. So BlackRock and the other large banks are siphoning off billions of fees. These things are delayed. The small business association is delaying things too. The small business association is so overwhelmed, it's not even funny. The small business association is more overwhelmed than the job, uh, the unemployment jobless claims at the state level. This is going to be a complete and total shit show.
Yeah, so so my friend Kevin, who's a successful small business owner, he's wondering how am I going to be able to afford my other expenses because you know, there's tons of other expenses. Labor is not the only input that needs to go into him running his business to generate cash flow. Toby, Toby says he owned two restaurants for 10 years, about 32% goes to employees, not 75. Toby, that is not what I'm saying. You're, you're talking about the reality of running a restaurant and your different input costs. I'm talking about how Congress is mandating in legislation by fiat that 75% of, of all the money that the small business owners are allowed to borrow in an SBA loan, at least 75%, has there, that is the minimum, has to be paid out to employees on the payroll. So this is people that do not, these are people in Congress that do not understand how to run a business that are forcing the SBA loans back to the workers. Okay, I understand the cost of running a restaurant. The people in Congress are the ones screwing this up, not me. Okay, well, I have other articles here about the, the banks to make billions on small business bailout. Of course, corruption. Millions of small businesses stunned to learn they are not eligible for bailout loans. Of course. Unprecedented $2.2 trillion bill fails most small businesses. By Bruce Wilds at the Advancing Time blog. Stop me, this is getting old. And of course there's going to be fraud. You know, there's going to be people probably creating LLCs that don't even have a business that are going to get these SBA loan checks and they're going to borrow the money and they're going to, you know, steal the money and default on it. There's going to be tons and tons of fraud with a lot of these other government programs like uh, social security fraud and welfare fraud and Medicare fraud and Medicaid fraud. Thank you for the super chat, Ike. He asked, when do I start preparing to move to a freer country with less big government? If you could, would you start moving to another country? The U.S. is going to hit, get hit the worst in the collapse. I don't know if the U.S. is going to get hit the worst. I think everyone's going to get hit. Ike, do you have enough money to get a second or third passport? Because if you leave the U.S. and you're not making, and you're making more than $90,000 a year, you're still going to have to pay taxes to the U.S. The fees to leave are enormous. To give up your citizenship, you're paying enormous exit taxes. Um, I would recommend speaking to Mark Nestman, N-E-S-T-M-A-N of Nestman Group, and talk about your options. He is not cheap, but he's considered the best uh, lawyer for getting people second pass, second and third passports and also either getting legally getting their U.S. citizenship out or moving their assets out of the country for high net worth clients. Thank you for the super chat, Justin. Oh yeah, please smash the like button. I have almost 300 people listening to this live stream show and almost no likes. I just focus on the content first and foremost. Okay, Jonathan, thank you for the super chat. He is a Patreon account contributor. I have over 600 now because I work my butt off. I hardly get any sleep most nights. I focus on providing value. I've been doing a pretty good job the last couple months, especially compared to a lot of these mainstream financial professionals that keep calling me names and trying to get on the podcast. Do you think while well, Warren Buffett sold Delta shares below 10% is a ploy so he can accumulate more shares in the next 45 days without reporting? Yeah, I'm not familiar with his investments in the airlines. Um, in general, I think the airlines are a really crappy business, but Buffett's going to go now. He's really corrupt, very political. He's going to go wherever the bailouts are. Um, Wells Fargo, which is a very large investment for him, is also sitting on a commercial real estate, commercial mortgage loan book that's um, toxic. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. Uh, also, Buffett has a big share position in U.S. Bank, which has even more exposure, um, well, almost as much exposure as Wells Fargo. 
to commercial real estate mortgages. Their loan book is very, very large. I think they're third or fourth. So Wells Fargo's number one, JP Morgan's number two for a commercial real estate loan book. I think U.S. Bank is, which Buffett owns a lot of shares of, is fourth. So Buffett was big on commercial real estate investments. He had a lot of exposure there. Buffett's going to go wherever the bailout money is. I wouldn't be surprised to see Buffett get a little cut of Boeing when the bailout is decided on that. I, I don't I don't get involved in those. Uh, the airlines are such a crappy business. And here's the thing. Everyone asked me about like credit ratings, downgrades, and bailouts. And there's there's an entire article for patrons behind the paywall about this. But bailouts can be different. Not everyone's going to get the same bailout. Did AIG get the same bailout as General Motors? Did the banks get the same bailout as AIG or, AIG or General Motors? No. The bailouts are going to be different. It depends on the industry. The home building, the uh, home builders in 2008 and 9 got enormous amounts of tax credits. The bailouts were different for the home builders back then. My friend Dave Kranzler was short a bunch of those home building stocks, and he did well for a while. And then Congress goes and changes, changes the rules with the accounting rules and gives the home builders enormous tax credits. This is the new normal we're in. Fast and furious rules changes, as I called it last night. Okay, Sean, thank you for the super chat. A second video today. I don't remember doing a first video. <laughs> I did the Welcome to Dystopia video last night. That was the first one in a while. Okay, let's talk about this uh, Bruce Wilds article here. Massive 2.2. I'll try to put the hedge eye... The hedge eye video that they did in the last day or so that they released on their YouTube channel about the restaurants. I'll try to put that, that at the end of this video. Because I think the restaurants and the SBA loans and the jobless claims yesterday and the unemployment data and jobs, non-farms, payrolls today, they all tie in together. The massive $2.2 trillion bill that was signed into law fails most small businesses, but the devil is well hidden in the details. There is so much disinformation and bullshit floating around about this program that it is difficult to get the details. As a landlord and small business owner, I can tell you that as of Thursday morning, the way the program is structured, it will be of little help to most small businesses. While the government continues to slam expensive legislation through, it seems they have no idea of the damage they are doing and how it is causing hundreds of thousands of businesses to close their doors forever. Washington has become so attuned to dealing with lobbyists from mega companies, it has lost sight of the fact small is small, and when this comes to business, this means usually under 20 employees, not hundreds. So 90% of businesses are small. It now looks like this bill will allow for a rapid maximum loan amount of two and a half times a company's average monthly payroll expense over the past 12 months. This loan would turn into a grant and be forgiven if they keep their employees on. This fails to take into consideration that not, not all small businesses are labor or payroll intense. Some businesses with large or expensive showrooms are getting hammered by rent, others by inventory or things like taxes, utilities, or even by having to toss products due to spoilage. This bill also fails to address the issue of what are these employees going to do while the company has no customers because their cities are going into semi, if not complete, lockdown measures due to quarantine efforts. Also, this means that the state and local governments and the federal government will not be collecting tax revenues, which creates a vortex doom loop. And that means that the Federal Reserve has to monetize, has to expand its balance sheet even more and monetize even larger government budget deficits. Welcome to dystopia, folks. Stiff drink time, as George Gammon would say, as my friend George Gammon would say. Due to quarantine efforts, they also ignore the fact that by keeping these employees on the payroll, a generous employer is left open to the harsh mandates laid out in the previous bill passed just weeks ago. And last but not least, many small business owners take little in the way of a paycheck and pump most of their earnings back into their company. So uh, they, are, they have asset rich but cash poor. If you own a small business, you know. Companies so it will grow faster. It appears little is being done by these companies and they are said to remain in dire straits. 
with so many tenants looking at foregoing rent, small landlords that don't have deep pockets also face huge problems. We have our heads in the sand if we think companies that exist on events where people gather will uh, overnight regain their luster. It is not like someone can simply flick a switch and things will return to normal. Yeah, human, humans are going to be very cautious now. Well, a rational person would. Most human beings are not rational though, right? Uh, reality undercuts the idea of the V-shaped recovery theory and the idea, yeah, the V-shaped recovery theory. Ask China about the V-shaped recovery theory. Okay, I am hearing, I put this out on Twitter. I am hearing a lot of rumors from a lot of different sources. My friend uh, Jeffrey Landsberg over at Commodore, Commodore Research, he just sent out a new China report in email blast to his uh, hedge fund clients saying that uh, the rumors, he's hearing a lot of rumors now about a second wave of coronavirus outbreaks in cities outside of Wuhan in China. And I've heard those rumors from for the last two or three weeks from a lot of different sources who do not know each other. So China tried to restart their economy and they're getting hit. Their data is purely fake, by the way. Their economic data. Their uh, infected and deaths are fake. Their economic data is even more fake than usual. So no, the, the idea of a V-shaped recovery, I don't know. We're, we're at least months away from that, from even thinking of restarting. I know Trump and the other Republicans want to restart. I mean, if China's getting a second wave, I don't know. Seems dangerous to restart too soon. Theory and the idea after the economy has come to a dead stop, it can quickly reboot and be back at full speed in a few months. Washington also seems oblivious to how much it can cost a community when a business fails. This extension of crony capitalism throws just enough to the masses to silence their outrage. I don't think 1200 a month is just enough. Large businesses with access to cheap capital will again be the winners. And the also, you have the in the Federal Reserve... Well, the Federal Reserve also is directly loaning... Forgot to mention this, just remembered... Federal Reserve is also directly loaning to corporate large corporations only now. So publicly traded large corporations, the Fed has skipped the banks, and the banks are not in good shape either. I just talked about their commercial real estate loan book. The banks have a lot. Their the banks bond portfolios are collapsing. That's why the Fed's going to buy all this and this still in some of this still investment grade bonds. The Fed's going to buy junk bonds. The Fed's going to buy subprime auto loans. It's only a matter of time. The banks are nowhere near as well, uh, as good a shape as the talking heads on CNBS and Bloomberg News are claiming, Bloomberg TV are claiming. You do not change the leverage ratio requirements and then lower the reserve requirement ratio down to zero if the banks are doing well. And then the banks also got hit with massive drawdowns in revolving credit facilities. I was looking at a chart and some of these um, industries there's a there's an article that goes through a, a lot of the different publicly traded companies that drew down the revolving credit facilities and how much. And some of these large corporations on a stock exchange drew down their revolving credit facilities 96%. If they had to draw down that much and they already had debt on their balance sheet, they're doing that to avoid bankruptcy. And hoping for a bailout, hoping that the economy restarts sooner than later. Extension of crony capitalism just enough to the masses to... Oh, oh the other... Just remembered, sorry, I'm, I, I didn't put down notes. The other thing I just wanted to talk about that I forgot a couple minutes ago was the leverage buyout fund in the Congress coronavirus bailout package or stimulus package. It's not really a stimulus package because the economy is not going to grow anymore. Well, not for a while anyway, not for a long time probably. So the uh, bailout, the uh, leverage buyout fund, the $500 billion only for large corporations, leverage buyout fund. So large corporations have cheaper access to capital and then can go in and buy temporarily distressed but quality small and medium-sized businesses who are getting screwed over, fucked over by the Small Business Association loans and all the rules that the limousine liberals or champagne socialists, mostly Democrats, in Congress are imposing that 75% of the loans have to go to payroll. Oh my God, that's just ridiculous. If you've ever run a business, you know that it is just ridiculous. You have so many other expenses. Labor labor should only be about at most like 30 or 40% at most for most businesses. 70, demanding 75% go to labor, my God. Why don't they just hand them equity? 
too. Why don't they just give them equity too? Give them the means of production. They need to own the means of production. Then the revolution will be complete. I'm being sarcastic, okay? I don't want to see messages that I said that. I'm being sarcastic. Okay, large businesses with access to cheap capital. Thanks, Congress. Thanks, Fed. They're getting two enormous credit lines here from the Fed and from Congress. Now, not every business is going to get going to get access to this trough. Maybe the cruise ship companies aren't. As of now, it looks like the cruise ship companies aren't. But some of these large businesses are. And they're going to go do acquisitions on fire sale prices, pennies on the dollar. And you know how it is. Once a large corporation buys a small or medium-sized business, they go and fire most of the people. So this is not the jobs numbers with this acquisition. The leverage buyout fund is not going to improve things. Large uh, for, for uh, people's jobs, for the amount of jobs. Large businesses with access to cheap capital will again be the winners, and big, and big losers are the middle class, small, and medium-sized businesses and upward mobility. If you want to read re the rest of the article, it'll be in the information description section. I am too pissed to read the rest. Oh, uh, another point here for Ike with the super chat. Thank you again for the super chat. Um, if you do not have the resources to hire someone like Mark Nesman, if you're not high net worth, you can start like a stock brokerage account and you can start buying some foreign stocks, some Canadian. There's some good Canadian companies now, some good, you know, like Sandstorm Gold, some other Canadian companies that are still profitable at these at these levels. So you can start buying some foreign stocks on your own by opening up a stock brokerage account at like E-Trade or Interactive Brokers or TD Ameritrade. So you can start diversifying out of the U.S. if you want a little bit, start buying some foreign stocks. Be careful though, you don't want as much foreign stock exposure as Peter Schiff or your Pacific Capital. You will get killed. Okay, a couple more Super Chats here, and then we'll wrap up the show. Thank you for the Super Chat, Wayne. He says the market isn't pricing in the COVID Wave 2 yet. Yeah, I mean, the COVID Wave 1 in the U.S. is not done, and China has, it looks like there's a lot of sources reporting China Uncensored is reporting for weeks now that a lot of cities in China are getting new outbreaks, a second wave. Um, you have Winston, who is Serpensa, and then you have Laowai86 on YouTube, ADV China. They're reporting from their sources that there's another waves of, of coronavirus in China outside of Wuhan. I've heard it from other sources as well. I put a tweet from a financial professional going into detail about factories in China outside of Wuhan getting outbreaks. And then my friend Jeffrey Landsberg at Commodore Research put an extensive report out today where he talked about the rumors. <laughs> okay, Chen Mika, thank you for the super chat. Patreon contributor also. There's a saying about the dollar in Asia, dollar harvesting. So weak dollar money out of the U.S. causing emerging market bubble. Strong dollar money back to the U.S. transferring emerging markets wealth. Well, that's very interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm not bullish on a lot of emerging market stocks right now. I don't think this is the time because I think they have way too much dollar denominated debt, and I think there's going to be a lot of defaults. Also, a lot of emerging markets have way too much, um, companies have way too much exposure to tourism. So tourism is, eh, tor you guys know this, tourism is not going to be good for a while. So they're reliant on more affluent American, European, Japanese, Chinese tourists going, and there's not going to be a lot of tourism for a while. And then also a lot of these countries have export economies with either base metals and energy commodities, which are not doing well. Or exporting uh, either luxury goods or commodities to China. Some of those commodities are not going to be doing as well. I don't think China has really recovered at the uh, their economic data that they've claimed. So I think emerging markets are going to get the brunt of it. The emerging markets are in a lot of pain. I think it can get worse for the short term at least. 
So again, I would disagree, politely disagree, respectfully disagree with Peter Schiff about uh, being long all these emerging market stocks. Okay, you have two questions. Why does Trump want a doll uh, weak dollar if strong dollar transferring emerging markets wealth into the U.S.? Um, because everyone preaches from the same economics hymn book. Everyone wants a weak dollar mer a version of mercantilism, as the Austrian School of Economics would say, to export. Everyone wants a weak dollar. Uh, everyone wants, excuse me, a weak currency. And the global economy actually functions better with a weaker dollar. So all these governments, whether it's the, the yen, the euro, the Chinese yuan, emerging markets currencies, the dollar, they all want their currency weaker because they're all using Keynesian economics and neo-Keynesian. Now it's morphing into MMT, parts of MMT at least, which is not really modern currency debasement, currency devaluation. But Keynesian economics is based off of old school mercantilism. There's some differences, but it's very similar to old school mercantilism with we weakening the currency to boost exports. The problem with boosting exports is what happens when your customer has no job? How can you have an export economy when your customer doesn't have a paycheck to buy stuff, doesn't have a paycheck to go on vacation? That's the problem right now. So the global economy is not functioning normally, and those dollars are not going outside the U.S. to where they're needed, and that's why the Fed had to step in. That's why the Fed had to do two currency swap press releases. Those currency swap lines are open-ended. There's almost no transparency. There's um, no cap, as far as I know, on the global repo for dollars. And then you have open-ended QE. It's, it's just insane, all the stuff that the Fed and the other central banks are doing. I think the amount of dollar-denominated dollar debt and the amount of these derivatives, these forward dollar swaps, dollar liabilities, it's easier to just call them dollar liabilities. The amount of the amount of those together, dollar-denominated debt and dollar liabilities that have defaulted has to be enormous. It has to be in the many trillions. And that's why the dollar index, in my opinion, is still at 100. It's above 100. When we're doing this live stream show, it's at 100.68. So in spite of all the craziness the Fed is doing, the dollar is not getting weaker. Thank you for the super chat, Toby. Oh, you have one more question here. Will the currency swap and QE infinity make the dollar weaker? Okay, not in the short term. In the short term, it doesn't look like it. Um, eventually, yes. And there will be a lot of inflation here in the U.S. Eventually, yes. Um, the timing of it, you have to look at velocity of money and when lending and spending here in the U.S. economy gets back to pre-coronavirus levels. Right now, velocity of money, which is lending and spending here in the U.S. economy, has collapsed. It was weak before the coronavirus. It has collapsed now. So the Fed, it, it's historical comparisons now are more like 1929 to 1937. The difference is the central banks can do even more currency and credit creation than they could back then. Okay, Toby Wilson, thank you for the super chat. Okay, super chat from JB Weld. Thank you, JB. Okay. JB asks, is anyone or has anyone done a case study of the economy after the Spanish flu? Obviously, it was a different age, but there has to be some lessons learned there. So that happened during, I screwed up the timing on this months ago. I got the date wrong. I went back and watched some documentaries on this and I reacclimated myself with the time period a little bit better because I am a history major, but we didn't learn about the, the Spanish flu. It's not really the Spanish flu. It started, I think, in Kansas, in a small town in Kansas. Um, Chris Martinson interviewed the author. It's, in, it's on his channel. He's interviewed the author of that book twice uh, who proved convincingly that the uh, global pandemic of 1918 started in Kansas and then spread to all the other countries. So it was during World War I. You had wage and price controls. You had gov I think the stock market in the U.S. was closed for a while. And then not too long after that, JB, you had the Great Depression in 1920. And the Austrian School of Economics loves to talk about the Great Depression in 1920 because that is the time where the Fed actually did basically nothing. So the Fed actually allowed the credit boom the overcapacity, the malinvestment, the misallocations of capital to go bust. And there was a lot of pain for about 18 months. 
you had record high unemployment for about 18 months, you had bankruptcies, and 18 months later, things were pretty good. The economy started ripping again. Now, eventually, the Fed started intervening after that, after that 18-month period with the bust and a recovery. And then in the 1920s, you had the Fed start to inject massive amounts of credit into the economy. It created a property bubble in Florida, in swampland in Miami, condos and beachfront property that was built, apartments. There's still a lot of uh, prop old properties there um, in South Beach that were built then. My grandparents had one of them uh, before they passed. So you had that, you had stocks on margin. So that was really after the global pandemic in 1918. The Fed actually did nothing for 18 months during the Great Depression in 1920. And there's a book out by uh, G G uh, Jim Grant of Grant's Interest Rate Observer about it. I don't think it's on audiobook, but I hear it's really good. You can go watch his lectures on YouTube. He has a number of lectures out about the book. They're really good. I've watched a few of them. So this, this pandemic is causing a collapse in tax revenues, is causing a collapse in demand. Demand for oil, consumer demand, travel and tourism is dead for now. Oh, another super chat. Thank you, Chen Mika. I appreciate it. Yeah, so the, the currency swaps are trying to actually weaken the dollar. The Fed's trying to do a lot of crazy stuff to, to try to prevent the dollar index from ripping past 103 again. I would not be surprised if the dollar index gets back up to 102, 103, maybe even past the 103, because it looked like the dollar index looked like it wanted to go a lot higher than 103 before the Fed, after another day, another bailout, another day, another bailout, another day, another bailout. The Fed was able to knock the dollar index back down, just like how the VIX got smashed. Um, they were able to knock the, the dollar index back down a little bit, but now it's rallying again. If the dollar index gets high enough, I would not be shocked to see the Fed announce that all student loan debts are canceled. Um, they're buying all the junk bonds. They're going to take out all the investment grade corporate bonds. They're going to buy all those because they're they're so desperate. Like Grant Williams said, Grant Williams nailed it. They are so desperate at this point to not let the dollar index go on that Brent Johnson, Raul Powell, uh, Shy Girl, Tracy Shoe chart, rip your face off rally even higher. Because if the dollar rallies that much higher, it will collapse anyone holding dollar denominated debt because their their local currencies with the Aussie dollar and many other local uh, local currencies that have dollar denominated debt. So these are emerging markets or other countries that have too much dollar denominated debt. If the dollar index goes to 120, as Brent Johnson is predicting, it will collapse everything. Anyone with dollar denominated debt outside the United States is risking collapsing then. So that's why the Fed is trying to do all the crazy stuff it's doing. And they're willing to do even more crazier stuff. They're going to they're gonna try, if things get bad enough, they'll buy all the subprime loans. They'll wipe away all the student loan debt. They're trying to do anything they can to prevent the dollar index from going out of control on that rip your face off rally even higher above 103. And they can change the rules. That The most important thing to know is we're in... Fast and Furious rules changes now. That's what I've labeled it. I think it's appropriate. The rules changes are fast and furious. Uh, thank you for the super chat, Anthony. Anthony is also a Patreon account contributor. Um, I don't know actually anything about that with radio waves and 3G and 4G and 5G. I, I don't know the correlation to any of that. The conspiracy theory that I think is, is accurate is the CEOs were tipped off about China, how bad things in, were in China and Wuhan, and that's why they quit like crazy. That's the conspiracy theory that I like. That all the corporate, the publicly traded company CEOs were all tipped off, that things were way worse, that you know there was hundreds of, thousands, hundreds of thousands or way over a million people infected in China, and they found that out. And that's why they... they uh, hit the eject button with their golden parachutes because they were told, oh shit, there's millions of people infected in China. There's tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands dead. This is going to spread everywhere. Um, this is going to take, you know, 18 months, two years, maybe longer for the global economy to pull itself out after all this. And we're getting out now. 
with our uh, with our bonuses, with the stock price still high. So uh, that's the conspiracy theory. If you want to call it a conspiracy theory, that's a consp conspiracy theory I subscribe to. Okay, that's it for tonight's stream. I've been talking a long time. I want to thank everyone for listening. How do I only have 100 likes, 104 likes, with almost 400 people listening to the stream? Just ridiculous. I mean, the video is going to get demonetized anyway, but whatever. Uh, the CEO, uh, Steven says, all the CEOs sold shares months ago. The CEOs always sold shares, though. The CEOs always dump. This Most of the CEOs never buy. The CEOs have been net sellers of shares for so long. The whole scheme is they use shareholder capital and load the balance sheet with debt and, and buy indiscriminately share buybacks. The CEOs never hold their <laughs> the CEOs almost never hold their own shares. They've been they've been dumping their shares for years, Ned Sellers. <laughs>